Hey, Merry Christmas. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Andrew, and I am one of the pastors here on staff at Country Bible Church. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. For those of you that are first-time guests, we want to give you a special welcome. We're grateful that you chose to be with us this morning and to be a part of what God is doing here at Country Bible Church and with those amazing kids. How cool is that, huh? How about those kids? Yes. Thank you to Miss Bethany for reading that story. Amazing. I also want to take a minute and welcome our online community. We love that you guys are tuning in from all over the place to be a part of what God is doing at Country Bible Church. Let me invite you up front to grab your Bible. Grab your Bible and turn to the book of Luke. And if you don't have a Bible, I want to invite you to raise your hand this morning and allow one of my friends to gift you a Bible. Consider this an early Christmas present. This is a gift from us to you. It's yours to have and to keep. If you need a Bible this morning, just raise your hand up unapologetically and let them know, hey, I'd like one. And they'll make sure to get you a Bible. If you're looking for Luke, you can find it at the beginning of your Bible in a table of contents or a little bit more than halfway through your Bible. It is the third book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to start off this morning by reading the first 20 verses together. It's not too dissimilar to what Bethany already did with our kids. Same, same text, same story, but I want to read through it in the narrative And then we're going to come back and we're going to spend some time thinking through some things together. So here we go. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. And he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in snugly strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. That night there were shepherds staying in fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story, all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept these things in her heart, and she thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. And it was just as the angel had told them. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word doesn't return void, that it is active and that it is alive and that it is still being written on our hearts this morning. God, I pray now for our time together that you would move in us and through us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do what only you're capable of doing. Redeem this time for your good and for your glory. And I pray now that the words of my mouth and that the meditations of our hearts would be seen as a gift that is holy and that is pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name and by his authority and by his power, we pray. Amen. Who are you inviting? That is a question that we wrestle with often in the Anderson house. We have three birthdays in the month of March alone. 
when our girls come to us, they come with two lists. They come with their wish list, complete with anything and everything that you can imagine. And oftentimes, they'll get creative, where we used to have Sears and Robux catalogs and JCPenney, where we would circle with marker what we wanted, and we would number them in order of importance. They will print off online, or they'll simply just add it to their Amazon uh, cart <laughs> and give us the list. They come complete with a second list, which is a name of all their friends that they want to invite to their party. A party's a big deal and we want to celebrate, but we have to have real talk with our kids. We have to help our children understand, no, MJ, you cannot invite every single first grade class at North Elementary School and South Elementary School and the church and throughout the greater Washington County area. That won't work. There is not enough Oreos on the planet to make enough dirt cake for all your friends. We need to narrow our focus. And she says, but dad, the more people I invite, the more presents they'll bring. And I say, yes, baby girl, economically you are a genius. But for our practical purpose, it doesn't make sense. Who are you inviting? And we help her narrow the focus, help her narrow the scope of who she wants to invite to the party. And if you think about it, this is a question that even into adulthood, we have to ask and answer ourselves all the time. We have wedding parties that we have to come up with a, a list of guests that we'll invite. We have anniversary celebrations and parties that we have to have a guest list. We have retirement parties that we throw. We still have birthday parties that we throw into our late, later years in life. And speaking of later years in life, uh, one of our former elders as of this morning reminded me that I do typically take some time off uh, from preaching in the summer so that I can recover my voice and, and recoup in my body. And he said, you know, at your age, you should think about stopping preaching in December or January and go south for the winter, like the rest of the snowbirds. And so I punched him, and now I'm ready to preach. <laughs> we think about who we want to invite to the party, these parties are critical to us. They're important to us. And we want to include people that have added value to our lives. We want to share in these moments together. We want to share in these celebrations together. Baby showers and all kinds of these parties. And, and I would tell you that as followers of Jesus, this is a question that we have to ask. This is something that we need to wrestle with. Who are we inviting to the party? And make no mistake about it, the Christian life is a party. Throughout Scripture, all 66 books from Genesis to Revelation, the meta narrative is God's love for us, God's redemption for us. And the culmination is a party where Scripture promises that there's going to be a mansion and these amazing elaborate streets and that in this house are many, many rooms and there's this elaborate banquet that will have this feast that will, that will beat all other feasts and that we have a guest list called the Lamb's Book of Life and there are people that we must invite to the party. Friends, where eternal life is concerned, I cannot think of a greater reason to celebrate or invite people to the party. And today... As we spend a few minutes together, I hope to ask and answer this question, who are you inviting? I encourage you to consider in your own heads and feel it in your own hearts, the, the gravity of this question, who are you inviting? Who are you inviting? We're gonna spend just a few minutes together kind of discovering some insights as we read through this text again, starting in verse eight. Prior to this, Quirinius, who is the governor of the, the region, is working for Augustus, Caesar Augustus, who gives the first of the census that he'll give. He'll give multiple census throughout his leadership, but this is the first, and it's not just unique to his region. There are multiple cities that are giving these census. It's about every 14 years that they'll give one, and the purpose is to determine how vast the empire is growing, as well as to develop a greater sense of taxation, to tax the people for the establishment of the empire. As 
a decree goes out that everybody needs to go back to their, to their home, to their family's lineage, to their family line, to where their roots are. We see that Joseph takes Mary, who's engaged to. This humble carpenter takes a mere maid in her teenage years, and together they'll travel back to the home of his forefathers. In this case, it's David, King David. And he'll go to the town of Bethlehem from Nazareth. And as he gets to Bethlehem, this city that is really small, it's quite quaint. It's not sprawling or elaborate by any stretch of the imagination. And in fact, church, we have done ourselves a bit of a disservice when we think about there's no room in the inn. We liken it to a hotel or to a a motel or to this big operation, but really this is a quaint town and at best it would have been like an Airbnb where homes would have reserved a bedroom for family members or guests. As the community is growing in terms of the number of people, the ability to take up occupancy at a guest's, as a guest in someone's home is becoming minimal and as Mary and Joseph arrive, they have no place to stay. There's no one that has extra room in their house. And she goes into labor as they come into Bethlehem and Joseph, doing the best that he can to provide, begins to scramble. And as he scrambles, it's likely, if you look at historical context and culture, that Mary actually gives birth to baby Jesus in the side of a cave a cave that has been stripped and, and cleaned and is used to, 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 to help birth these ewes that will become sacrificial lambs, but that it cannot be contaminated because they have to be ceremonially clean. And so there they find the cleanest stall or the cleanest cave and Mary goes into full-blown labor and she'll give birth to Jesus. And she'll lay him in a feeding trough where these lambs would come collectively for their food, where these shepherds would watch them and separate the the purified lambs that would need to be set apart according to the Mishnah for a year. A Mishnah is a Jewish book of law. They would be set apart for 365 days before they could be appropriately offered up for anyone to buy as a means of sacrificial offering. And they would use a unique measure to separate them from the other sheep in the fold. What they would do is they would take these, the the, the most pure of ewes, and they would wrap them in these cloths or these bandages that would be tied together. And the purpose was twofold. It was to swaddle them, to keep them comfortable and, and, and confined as though they were still in the womb. And number two, it was to protect them from impurities that were around them. So we see now that as Jesus is born, he is wrapped in these cloths. He is swaddled. As Micah 5, 2 points out, and we'll read that here in a minute together, this is the fulfillment of prophecy. This is, this is the word of God, hundreds of years old, that has come into fruition now. Baby Jesus wraps in swaddling cloths there in the manger. And we have this incredible encounter where we'll introduce to the story these shepherds who are at a field nearby. If you want to follow along, I'm reading in chapter 2, verses 8, and we'll read to the end. The night that Jesus was born, it says that that night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby. It was thought that shepherds would have kept the flock out in the fields between April and November because of the weather and the warm months. They would have been nearby and they were guarding their flocks of sheep. A couple of interesting things that we should note about these shepherds. Number one, they were to guard these sheep with their lives. They would build this this common pen and they would collectively put the sheep in there together and they would even lie down in front of the entryway into the pen acting as a physical gate keeping the sheep from leaving the pen or any intruders from getting into the pen. But let's talk just for a moment about the type of men culturally that these shepherds could have been like. Historically, as you study it, these shepherds were nomadic. At minimum, they were semi-nomadic. They, they were wanderers. They were drifters. And they took a job that, 
that not anybody would take. In fact, most people wouldn't want this job. It was rough and it was difficult. And in this context, shepherds didn't have the best reputation. In fact, many regarded them as ill repute, as people who were thieves, who, who would do just about anything for their own personal gain and their own personal benefit. They were reckless at times. And so here, it seemed fitting that they would put their own lives on the line to protect these sheep. And it says in verse 8 that that night there were shepherds staying in fields nearby and they were guarding the flocks of sheep. When, in verse 9, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them. And we learn now the presence includes this radiance of the Lord's glory that surrounded them. Whenever we see the term radiance or an angel appearing, we should imagine this illumination, this bright light, this radical light that is penetrating and pierces. And as these shepherds are sitting there, it says that they were terrified. Well, why were they terrified? A couple of reasons, I suspect. Number one, because they were caught off guard. They were, they were shocked. They weren't expecting this. How many times had they spent the night together guarding the sheep? And yet nothing like this had ever happened. And so to have an angel of the Lord appear with all of this glory, with all of this splendor, with all of this radiance, perhaps it was shocking to them. Or, or could it be that these were men with the reputation that preceded them that were doing the things that they shouldn't have been doing and they maybe got caught? Could it be that they were hanging out and all of a sudden the, the angel of the Lord appears and, and they have to quickly put out their cigarette and kick it behind them? Could it be that they were just sitting there wondering, okay, we're caught. What are we busted doing? Trying to, trying to quickly come up in their own minds with the things that they could have been found guilty of. Whatever it is, we see that the emotional response when they encounter the presence of the Lord is fear. That they're physically terrified. And it says that they were terrified, but verse 10 says, but the angel of the Lord reassured them. In other words, invoked confidence or spoke confidence over them, saying, don't be afraid, he said. I, I bring you good news. That word good news in the original language is where we get the same word, evangelize. To evangelize is to proclaim. It's to, it's to bring forth a tremendous message, in this case, the gospel message, to share the, the glory of God. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you're going to recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Pretty specific instructions on what they'll find when they get there. And then it says in verse 13, suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. We see this description, this heavenly army throughout the Old Testament as a description of the presence of God, of the glory of God, the all-encompassing glory of God. That this is a big deal, and it, 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 it's worth noting that it uses terminology like an army. And when you think of an army, you think of soldiers who are ready for battle. You think of soldiers who have trained together, that have worked together, that have been in the foxholes together, that they are ready collectively together, that they are standing lockstep, hand in hand, arm in arm, ready to go to battle together. And in this case, there is an army that is set apart to praise God. They are ready to go forth with the gospel, the good news. The good news that the prophecy has been fulfilled. What is the prophecy? I want to share with you from Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5 says, Mobilize, marshal your troops. The enemy is laying siege to Jerusalem, and they're going to strike Israel's leader in the face with a rod. But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all of the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. 
The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Then at last, his fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land, and he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength and the majesty of the name of the Lord God. Then his people will live there undisturbed, and for he will highly be honored around the world, and he will be the source of peace, an all-encompassing peace. Not an emotional peace, but an intellectual and a physical and a relational and an emotional peace. And that peace leads to joy. And here, the angel declares glory to God in the highest heaven, joined by an army celebrating together peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Culturally, in their time, people would pay a herald to publicly proclaim a party, to publicly co proclaim a celebration and the more money that you had to pay, the more heralds one could hire, which would then take the message to even further lengths. If you had a little bit of money, then you could afford a little bitty herald. And if you had a lot of money, you could afford a lot of herald. Today, we don't have heralds in the sense that we're talking about contextually with scripture and in this text, we have Facebook. We have Twitter. We have Instagram, we've got TikTok, we've got Snapchat, we've got email, we've got snail mail. And when we want to tell someone about something that is significant in our lives, we can share it in an instant, in a moment, instantaneously. I will never forget the day that MJ, our seven-year-old, was born. How quickly word spread. We were excited at her birth. It was unexpected that Stacy would become pregnant. And when she did become pregnant, as we went to the doctors and went through the, the process of carrying MJ and getting ready for delivery, we learned throughout the course of the pregnancy that Stacy was a, a high risk pregnancy. And MJ, when she was in vitro and they did imaging, they found multiple holes in her heart they found that the nuchal fold on the back of her neck was enlarged, and they found that her femur measured multiple inches shorter than it should have, which was indicative of a child that was either A, they got the, the, the date of the birth wrong, or B, someone who may have either trisomy 18 or Down syndrome. And they told us, the doctor, the only thing left to do was amniocentesis. They asked us if we wanted to do this, and Stacy and I, through tears, stood at the high-risk pregnancy doctor as they had done all these tests, and we determined together that we did not need to do an amniocentesis because regardless of the outcome, this was a gift from God that we were going to love unconditionally. We were preparing in our hearts for whatever the Lord may will for us. And on the day that... Stacy went into labor with MJ. We were there in the hospital with two of our closest friends in the world, Dave and Jill Olmsted. Jill is like a mother to Stacy, and she was in the hospital room with us. She was standing next to Stacy, gripping her hand and brushing her hair and comforting her. And I, on the other side, was trying to comfort Stacy. Dave was just mere feet on the outside of the room with the door closed when the doctor looked at Stacy and said, it's time. Your baby's head is crowning. You need to push. And Stacy looked at me, and I will forever have this memory seared in my mind. She said, I can't do this. Afraid of the outcome, not knowing what to expect. And I said, we got this. God's got this. We're going to be okay. And as Stacy began to push, in mere moments, MJ was born. And I will never forget the look on our doctor's face as she started crying, handing MJ over to Stacy and said, your baby girl is perfect. She's just tiny like you, not her dad. <laughs> and in that moment, I grabbed my phone and I snapped a picture of mom and baby, Stacy 
covered with tears and MJ lying there. And as quick as I could, I began to get the statistics and I, I sent out an image to the world. And Dave said, who was just on the other side of the door, said, wow, I saw your baby girl before I ever even came in the room. That's how quick it spread through social media. We have, we have a social media platform to tell everybody that we know and love what we're excited about, what we're celebrating, what we're, what we're partying for. They had a herald, and in this case, not only was it the, the host of heaven's armies that had come down to, to herald, to proclaim this great news of comfort and joy to these shepherds, but God would use the most likely of individuals to be a herald for the rest of the world. Let's keep reading. In verse 15, when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. We've got to see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village and they found Mary and Joseph and there was the baby lying in the manger. Verse 17 says, after seeing him, the shepherds, what? The shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. These men, these ill reputes, these men that had horrible reputations in their community, that had a job that no one admired or wanted or desired, these men that were the least likely of messengers, God chose to use to give the world the greatest message that the world would ever know. And what did they do with that message? They told everybody about the party. They told everyone that they came into contact with what they had seen. The reason for the celebration, the reason for the party. In verse 18, it says, all who heard the shepherd's story, all who heard the heralds were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. I want to tell you that in just a couple of days on Christmas Eve, this verse right here, verse 19, is going to be the basis for our message. I would encourage you, if you don't have anywhere to be, Please come out on Christmas Eve as we celebrate and study this passage together. Verse 20 says, The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. The gospel interrupted their lives. The gospel message, the good news these heralds who came with this message that unto you a Savior is born. Today in the city of Bethlehem, the prophecy fulfilled from Micah all those, all those centuries ago has come full circle. And you will find this baby, you will find this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. These shepherds who knew how to identify the sacrificial lambs because they were responsible for, for, for giving birth to these baby ewes and for setting aside those that were holy, that were separate from the rest, that were the, the most spotless, and they would wrap them in swaddling cloths to, to keep them comfortable and to protect them from getting unclean. They knew about the sacrificial lambs, and yet here again is the greatest sacrifice the world will ever know. They knew what they were looking for. And as they came and they found Jesus, it was just as the heralds had told them it would be. And they went and they invited everyone to the party. You see, the gospel interrupted their lives. And as the gospel interrupted their lives, it changed the trajectory of what was important to them. It changed the trajectory of their conversation. It changed the trajectory of how they spent their time. And they invited everyone to the party. They invited everyone to take part of what God had promised the world that was now here in front of them. The greatest message the world will ever know. That God, in his infinite wisdom and sovereignty, and because of his love for the entire world, a God who loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him won't perish but have eternal life, that God loved the world so much he didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it, once and for all, for all, this message of peace, of an intrinsic, visceral peace that affects every part of your body, that the gospel interrupts your life 
And it changes the trajectory of everything. And they were so overcome with emotion. You see it throughout, don't you? They were initially filled with fear. And then they were filled with awe. And then they were filled with joy. And then they were filled with an attitude of worship. There's this emotional progression that takes place in their lives. And at the excitement of what God had done, they go and they invite everyone to the party. And the Bible says that everybody who heard these heralds' message, everyone who heard from these shepherds were amazed at what they heard and what they saw. There is something that is important that you and I understand today, and that that is God has chosen your life and my life to be a representation of his life, which changes our life for all eternity. God has chosen you and I to be the gospel bearers, to be the heralds, and we have a responsibility with this gospel message. We have a responsibility to, in kind, like these shepherds, be heralds to the world. And I promise you, friends, that when your peers and when those passerbyers who are observing the way you live your life hear your testimony, your personal story about your encounter with Jesus and how the gospel has interrupted your life for the better and forever, they will be amazed. When you tell them how your encounter with Jesus changed your life forever, they too will be inclined to come to the party they too, like these shepherds, will be inclined to say, let's go and see for ourselves this miracle that has happened, this miracle that has taken place. Who are you inviting to the party? The problem is, most of us understand the gospel, but far too few of us let it interrupt our lives will intellectually identify with the greatest message the world has ever known. But we stop short of letting the gospel interrupt our lives. Notice that Luke, as he's telling the story, doesn't say that as the angels departed, the shepherds looked around at each other and said, well, I'm glad that's over. Got a cigarette I could borrow? And stay there. They were so moved by this message that they allowed the gospel to interrupt their lives. And in turn, they invited everyone to the party. And as people came and heard and experienced for themselves, that same message that had interrupted their lives would in turn interrupt those who heard. They were astonished. They were amazed. They were in awe. What will you do with the greatest gift, the greatest party, the greatest celebration the world has ever known? My wife just yesterday hung this really long golden ribbon from a, uh, an ornate paper clip from our wall, and up and down this gold ribbon, she has clipped... Christmas cards and letters from friends and family and people who wanted to send us what they're celebrating. That this year God has done this and these people got married and this person retired and they had a birthday and all the things that they're excited about. And we sit back and we look at these, these, these invitations to celebrate with them and we celebrate what God is doing in their life. Friends, what about where the gospel is concerned? Who are you inviting to the party? Who are you sharing the greatest message the world will ever know with? Greater than any birth announcement, greater than any wedding invitation, greater than any birthday party you and I will ever know. The greatest party the world will ever know. And guess what? Unlike Stacy and I, when we have to go to MJ and say, baby girl, you can't invite all of North School and all of South School and all of the church and all of Washington County. This party that Jesus invites us to is for everyone, male and female, Greek and Jew, haves and have-nots. You say, but I don't know if I can share the message. If only you knew about my life and I don't have, I don't have a platform to share. Friends, let's just spend a minute as we wrap up today thinking about who God chose to use to share the greatest message this world will ever know. Joseph, a humble carpenter, 
Mary, a teenage girl, a Gentile girl who is likely a maid, shepherds who in that context may have been seen as ill reputes. And Jesus, not coming robed in purple on a chariot, arriving like the kings of their kind, but coming in the form of a baby. And angels who would come as a collective army praising and celebrating. And all those who heard, who would adopt the message for themselves and share the greatest party that the world will ever know. If you can't relate to any one of those, I don't know who you can relate to. But I know, like I know, like I know, that we are called, you and I, to be heralds, to be inviters and to be investors into other people's lives. And our story, our story is to share with others how the gospel has interrupted our lives and changed our life forever. So my question this Christmas is, who are you inviting to the party? Who are you inviting to the party with how you live your life? Who are you inviting to the party with the things that you're gonna post on social media? Who are you inviting to the party by those that you invite to come and be a part of what God is doing here at Country Bible Church and in the surrounding community? Who are you inviting to the party by how you live your life? You and I have a response and a responsibility, and that is to invite people to experience the gospel, the good news, the greatest message the world will ever know. What will you do with that, and who will you invite? Father, I thank you for our time this morning. I thank you for this opportunity to share and to discover and to lean in and to learn. And I continue to invite you to move in us now. Dynamo Numa, the power of the Holy Spirit, breathe life into this message in us. May we adopt it, and may we share radically and generously how the gospel has interrupted our lives and all for your glory. And as we do, Lord, as we invite people to the party, I ask that you would give us a a boldness about us, a boldness, a conviction to the call that we have received to, to be the gospel bearers, to be the good news tellers. And I pray that as you empower us with a boldness, that you will also give us a favor with those around us, that as we share this invitation to the party of how the gospel has interrupted our lives, that, Lord, you would give us favor with the people, that they would be quick to listen, and that you would ready them to understand and come to the party. In Jesus' name, amen.